one final topic I'd like to get to before we end, if you're up for it, is I'd like to talk about psychedelics for a bit. Um, Let's stay with the, the previous matter for a moment. On, sure. res on resonance, you started with okay. that. Someone says, this resonates with me. What does that mean? Is that a test of truth at all? Or does it just mean there's part of my brain that gets excited when I hear that you feel that way about such and such? You see, I think people, when, when you say it resonates, that was clear. And I think that's a good way to use that word. It means it rings a bell. But, it, but other people use that as a test of facticity. If something resonates with me, that means it must be true. A lot of people use the idea of, of resonance that way. A lot of people do. I think that's a very foolish uh, test of facticity. If it resonates, what does that really mean? Now, I understand people would like to think that there's a level of intuition and we can't access it directly, but when something resonates, it means that intuitively it makes sense. I get all that, but then I just extend the critique to your intuition. That's not a test of anything. Yes, you may have a very strong feeling about something. I'm not saying discard the feeling. What I'm saying is just notice that the feeling that the review is not the movie. Let's put it that way. See, if you're always reviewing everything and saying this resonates, this part resonates with me, but this part doesn't, that's not the movie, that's the review. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's yeah. All right. You want to talk about psychedelics and all that? Well, yeah, but um, um, there was this Harvard psychedelic group, you know, that like a student group of at Harvard of a psychedelic enthusiast. And there's this lecture on YouTube by them. I forget the name of the guy who runs it, but he has some interesting ideas. And he was doing this kind of interesting to look at PowerPoint presentation with lots of beautiful, trippy images. But he had this point that I found very interesting. He was talking about DMT in particular, but I think this idea, because I watched some more of his videos on psychology, he's basically coming up with his own psychological model based on what he's saying. Um, and that goes beyond psychedelics that would also include mental illness and um, all sorts of things. But basically, um, the, the idea applied to DMT is that DMT is a five minute experience, like salvia, which I've heard you talk about in the gathering videos. And, and so at the very peak of it, he says, there's this um, maximum chaos effect. And I was just listening to a Terrence McKenna lecture last night, kind of randomly that came up on YouTube where he was talking about um, what DMT does is it doesn't just give you something unfathomable or astonishing to try to analyze, it does this, re, I forget how he put it, because he has such a poetic, beautiful way of talking, but he was talking about like the language analyzing mechanism of the brain or mind itself sort of changed so much that it, like what it's astonishment looking at astonishment or something like this. And, and so the way this Harvard guy was talking, um, he was saying at the very peak, which he, which he claims only lasts like 20 seconds or less or something of a DMT trip, it's a maximum chaos, maximum information overload, basically. And he said, anyone who tells you they take something away from that in terms of meaning or memory, he believes they're lying or they fooled themselves, basically. Because what happens, according to him, is then you come down to these other layers where there's more and more order comes back in and, and sense making and then perhaps entities appear or stories appear, you know, things that are more familiar to how our language and models of reality work. So it goes from maximum chaos to basically what he would call an optimal point of pleasure, 
which would be 50% chaos, 50% order. And then you come back to your mundane order state and you try to make sense of all of it, um, or your mind just does on its own. Um, so, you know, like I, whatever that the story is, you know, which are very entertaining to hear people's stories about psychedelics. I, I have no interest in doing them anymore, but I used to um, a few times, not like a bunch, but I, I got a lot out of it. And, and it served a great purpose for me where it, it, it took me out of the reality that I was trapped by. You know, it, it gave me this depending on no thing kind of experience where it's pure chaos and then the brain has to rewire and make sense of things in this new context, so to speak. Um, so I'm just throwing a lot of ideas out there again. And, but the main idea, yeah, you, yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on this model of like, of psychedelics? Oh, by the way, he also said that traumatic experiences can do this and spiritual or meditation experiences can do this. And, and also full disclosure, I, I've had what at the time I considered a Samadhi experience about a little over two years ago, which was very beautiful, lasted, you know, quite a few hours and then kind of went away. But very, and, and, and to, and it, it included all of the beauty of psychedelics in it without side effects, so to speak. And, but it came and went just like a drug. And um, yeah, yeah, but, but I, I guess all of those experiences take you to a place of pure chaos, or as Terence calls it, pure astonishment. And then you come back down, your mind rewires around that, so to speak. Um, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, everything comes and goes, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. So it's important to have experiences and then not cling to them. Very important. If we can do that, we can go on living. It's just beautiful. It's beautiful to, to actually be here, to live. And so I like the, um, that I like that view of uh, DMT trip. That's kind of my experience with that stuff. It's uh, really high octane stuff and blows your mind right off its center entirely. And then probably the pleasure part, as you would say, is after the peak. Um, I did have this experience. I had these series of experiences with Salvia Divinorum, which I talked about at the gathering. Um, that is even more high octane stuff than DMT. A lot more. That, that's that's a different uh, different uh, octave entirely. After so it's hard to get enough of it. You have to be real quick because someone will have to take the pipe out of your mouth. I mean, you're gone as soon as you get any of it. So I worked my way up to it because I was really afraid of it um, in a lot of ways. And my wife was um, tending me because you need someone there to tend you. There's a lot of things that can happen. You can get up and start destroying a room has happened to a lot of people. Well, so anyway, she had me surrounded by pillows and I'd lie back and prepare the pipe and all this. The first few times I got stoned and it was interesting, but I did not really get enough. But like the fifth or sixth try, I got enough. Now, that was my last Salvia Divan Arm trip. Um, that was years ago. Um, it was not like any other experience because for months afterwards, months, I kept asking myself, is that other place real where I was? Or this is real. And I could not bridge the gap. I just couldn't decide. <laughs> It, it was it was really hard. I mean, because um, this other place that I went to, which had other characters in it, and I was there, except I wasn't who I am here. I was something else. Um, uh, it was very, really bizarre. 
And I've had a lot of, I mean, I exper experimented with psychedelics many years ago. Uh, ketamine, I, I had a doctor friend who injected me and my wife with ketamine a few times. That was amazing dissociation mm -hmm. experience. Uh, DMT, I used to smoke that in my 20s sometimes. Um, but this was something else entirely. And my friend Robert Hall, a Buddhist teacher, was still alive in those days. And I, in fact, I turned him on to a, a salvia trip, which I talked about at the gathering. It, it, it shook him profoundly also. Um, I, but before he tried it, I, I described this to him. And I said, was that our world real? And he said, come on, that, you know, you, you know, you know better than that. But the thing is, I know now that he was right. At least I hope he was. I think he was. But I did not know that at the time. I went through this period of actually several months where I started to feel that I had had a glimpse into reality and that this other thing that I was living here was not I, it's I have no words for it. I couldn't I couldn't bridge the gap. There, it was too it was like they were too far apart. I couldn't they neither world belonged within the other world, not at all. It's two different two different universes. Well, that's all just taking place in a brain. This is what happens when a certain amount of some certain chemical alters the ordinary um, physics of, of the brain. That's clear. It's not that these substances have magical powers, which Terence sometimes used to say they did. He thought, you know, he, he was a wild man. But um, uh, I guess I'm a bit of one myself in that sense. But, but uh, it's not that these substances, I believe, have magical powers or genies built into them or something. It's not really like that. This is the sense of self, as I see it, is dependent upon a very fine adjustment of neurochemical reactions that are taking place constantly, countless ones. And you get some substance in there that alters those. And uh, it's different. One good hit of DMT, you won't ask yourself if, if it worked. And see, it's not like meditation. Meditation, maybe you, know, you try it. And yes, if you have one of these openings, then you'll, you'll understand that there's something to all this talk. But with, with a DMT, there isn't any of that. There's no denying it. And whether you believe in it or not, whether you practice DMT or you just did it once, it's all the same. Your mind will, your brain chemistry will be blown out. So that's how I see that. It's, it's, this is, I, I, I've got to tell you, to, I guess we're closing now. I, I see this all naturalistically. In other words, I, I believe that what we are is a brain and a body. There are other explanations, all these spiritual explanations. I get that, but I, I don't have much interest in that. I believe that we're animals and that it's, a, it's inexplicable how all this stuff is happening. There's no explanation that we have access to, but the brain can be modified in many ways. And when it is, our experience is modified. And that's pretty much how I see it. It's just naturalistic. Not that there's some outside consciousness and all this is arising and these objects look unconscious. I don't know about that. Seems, it's, that seems a bit complex. For I mean, this is what Ramana Maharshi said. He said, I'm so glad I never got involved in all that complexity. He meant of the data. He said, I didn't take to it. Ah, it's, that's those words I couldn't remember. I, 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 he said, I, I didn't take to it. Mm. That's me. I didn't take to it. So I had the awakening art, but I, and I tried to make sense of it afterwards. I read the books and everything and other people's experience. I tried to fit it into a box and I really couldn't. And I'm so glad I didn't take to it. Because then you then you're in a religion. 
and mm -hmm. see, I'm not an atheist. You mentioned that before, atheist. I'm not, I'm not an atheist. I just have no interest. I don't take to it. That's not the same thing. I just, my mind doesn't work that way. It's yeah. really simple, but I had the awakening. So the terms that I have to discuss that are psychology and art, basically. But I'm not saying there's something wrong when um, Nisargadatta talks about it philosophically. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I got something out of reading um, some of his uh, darshans. They're interesting. They stimulated my, my imagination in various ways. This is what I'm saying. You take it in, you make use of it, uh, and the rest you just uh, evacuate. And that's what I hope that people will do with, with what I have to say. Not make a big deal out of it. You, you heard it. Great. You don't have to follow Robert. You got what you got. Move on, you know, go to the next, go to the next flower, like a busy bee and get some nectar out of that one. 